So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. SERPI is here for you. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget, or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERP has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERP provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. Therapy has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Serpi now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ng batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making ipang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research 
na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs, research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget, or Type surf-p.pids.gov.ph SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SIRP has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERP provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERP has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SIRPI now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ng batas, pag-aralan mo ng gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik 
ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis sa ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! In our series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series where we feature our policy studies and the insights of government policymakers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. With this webinar series, which we started in 2020, we hope to provide an accessible venue for evidence based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila CR, and I will be your moderator. The skyrocketing prices of oil and oil products that have made the cost of pretty much everything go up have incited calls from various individuals and groups, including policymakers, for the revival of the Oil Price Stabilization Fund, or the OPSF. The argument of those proposing to bring it back is to mitigate the impact of the price increase on the affected sectors. When it was implemented, the OPSF, OPSF 
absorbed any price increase incurred by the oil companies, making the selling price lower than what it should be. But is reviving the OPSF really the right course of action? What was the Philippines' ex real experience with the OPSF? What other options does the government have to address the rising oil prices? Let us know the facts from our experts this afternoon. But before that, may I call on Dr. Marife Ballesteros, Vice President of PIDS, for her opening remarks. First, let me acknowledge the presence of key officials from the government, the Department of Trade and Industry Assistant Secretary Anne Claire Cabochan, uh, Senate of the Philippines Deputy Director Ivan Mark Galura, OIC Director Noemi Sab Sabornido, and Senate Economic Planning Office Executive Director Merwin Salazar. From the House of Representatives, Director Hanalena Ulladas, CBPRD Executive Director Novel Bangsal, and Directors Dina Pasaki and uh, Elsie Gutierrez. From the Office of Cabinet Secretary, Director Maria Catherine Endosa. From the Board of Investments, we have Executive Director Maria Corazon Halili Dichosa and Director Raquel Echage. From the Department of Science and Technology, Regional Director Noel Ajo. We have from the private sector, Agrico Technologies Managing Director uh, Alvik Hossel. From the academe, let me acknowledge uh, Pamantasa ng Lusod, the Manila President, Emmanuel Leiko, the University of the Visayas Executive Research Director, Victorina Sosa, Cagayan State University Director, Ramon Henry Canapi. From the CSO, NGOs, INGOs, uh, the, we have the World Bank Philippines Country Director, Ninjam Dio, uh, Pampanga Chamber of uh, Commerce and Industry, Executive Director Joyce Del Rosario, Lord, Lorma Community Development Foundation, Executive Director Andrew Cesar Rimando, and Basagana Sakahan Director Daniel Agustin. Friends from the media, our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, and the private sector, and those who are watching to the PIDS and SERPI Facebook pages. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. I believe all of us are aware and concerned with the rising prices of oil and petroleum products. From, for several months now, we have been experiencing spikes in oil prices that is indicative of another blooming crisis. The geopolitical tensions between Russia and Ukraine, and the contagion effect among oil producing countries to hold on the supply and ex exportation of oil and petroleum products is said to have triggered the current situation. This global issue affects everyone. The impact can lead to a recession as oil and petroleum products are the lifeblood of modern societies. Both consumers and businesses bear the brunt of oil price increases, but it is particularly damaging to poor households, micro and small enterprises, and wage workers. A few days ago, the Philippine Statistics Authority announced the latest inflation figures which, as measured by the Consumer Price Index, has jumped to 5.4% in May from 4.9% in April. So that's in a period of one month. This was attributed by experts not only to the rising prices of oil products, but also to the impacts of the pandemic. So while we have yet to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, the economy must also deal with the possibility of an oil crisis. So today's topic on the Oil Price Stabilization Fund or the OPSF is thus timely. The current situation calls for policy action and one of the actions being floated in government and the academic circle is the revival of the oil price Stabilization Fund or OPSF. If pushed through the OPSF revival, 
in the words of our resources, today's uh, resource speaker for this afternoon, is tantamount to a policy reversal of the downstream oil industry deregulation that began in 1998. The reforms in the oil industry, particularly its deregulation, were extensively studied in the Philippines as well as in other countries. Essentially, some studies are saying that deregulation is good, but there are also critics of the dereg deregulation law who argues that the law had been ineffective. Uh, in the case, for instance, in the Philippines, prices of petroleum products still rose. This afternoon, the featured PID is a study authored by our senior research fellow, Dr. Adoracion Navarro, will provide clarity into these opposing views. She will discuss the history of the OPSF and why the country deregulated the oil industry, as well as the experiences of other countries that still have the fuel price stabilization fund. More importantly, she will present the risk of reviving the OPSF to the Philippines and provide alternative policy responses. To enrich the discussion, we have invited oil industry experts who will share with us their insights on how the Philippines can mitigate the impacts of rising oil prices. We are deeply uh, honored to have with us um, Director Reno Abad of the Department of Energy Oil Industry Management Bureau, the Philippine National Oil Company President and Chief Executive Officer, Jesus Cristino Posadas, and the Philippine Institute of Petroleum Executive Director, Rafael Capinpin. Thank you for accepting our invitation. So to our participants and those joining us online, I hope you can stay until the end of the webinar. Let's all look forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you. And I now uh, give you back to the, give back the virtual floor to Dr. Shar. Thank you very much, uh, VP uh, Ballesteros. So friends, let's begin our um, conversation by listening to the presentation of Dr. Adoracio Navarro. Dr. Navarro is a, research, a senior research fellow at PIDS and her research interests are regional uh, development, energy and other infrastructure sectors and public-private partnerships. From November, uh, November 2016 to June 2020, she served as Under Secretary for Regional Development at the National Economic and Development Authority, where she supervised the regional development staff at the central office and the 15 NEDA regional offices across the country. Dr. Navarro holds a PhD in economics from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, a Master of Public Administration major in uh, Economic Policy Management from Columbia University in New York, and a Master of Arts in Economics from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Dr. Navarro, the floor is now yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. CR, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And uh, also thank you for the uh, welcome remarks and setting the context, uh, PIDS Vice President uh, Ben Ballesteros. Um, I'm grateful for the research assistance uh, provided uh, excellently by uh, research associate uh, Cristina Ortiz and uh, uh, research analyst uh, Jethro Camara. Uh, so here's my presentation. I hope that uh, everyone is seeing this clearly. Uh, for a fuller discussion of this, uh, by the way, uh, I invite you to read uh, PIDS discussion paper 2022-16 on the OPSF and the downstream oil industry deregulation. Lead us not into reversal temptation and deliver us from obfuscation. obfuscation. Uh, it was released uh, last May 9. Okay, so let's proceed. So th this will be my uh, discussion flow. I'll first trace the origin and demise of the OPSF, then uh, discuss the risks of reviving it, and uh, a few rema remaining countries with a uh, similar fund, the premise in and promises of deregulation, the possible policy responses are given uh, the uh, uh, 
seeming temptation to reverse our policy. And then other ways forward and uh, final remarks uh, on behalf of the poor. Now on the origin and demise of the OPSF, um, usually uh, policymakers and academics uh, trace the history of the OPSF from 1984, but uh, it's better to trace it uh, uh, in 1971, the start of heavy regulation, but uh, before that, uh, before 1971, uh, there's free market in the downstream oil industry. There's freedom of entry and exit by firms and prices not regulated by the government. And then in 1971, RA 6173 was enacted uh, and this established the Oil Industry Commission to regulate the domestic prices. It also created a special fund, uh, which later became known as the Oil Industry uh, Special Fund. Uh, it had broad uses for um, uh, even for research, but it was also used in profit regulation and price stabilization. So this is the, the origin of a, a fund for price stabilization. And then in 1979, a, a, a special fund was carved out of that uh, uh, oil industry special fund and it's called consumer price equalization then this fund had eroded uh, by 1983 and it was abolished but the abolition of uh, uh, this equalization fund uh, for uh, for a specific price stabilization was uh, um, short-lived because in 1984 the OPSF was created. It was created through Presidential Decree 1956, which uh, imposed uh, uh, new taxes and re revised specific taxes uh, because uh, of uh, the economic crisis that uh, uh, we were encountering at the time. And th that is to help the cash-trapped and uh, heavily indebted government. The law also declared the OPSF as the mechanism for stabilizing the petro uh, prices of petroleum products. Now let's uh, look at the design of the OPSF. So uh, what are the contributions? These uh, were the increase in uh, ad valorem taxes and customs duties on petroleum products, and as well as the increase in tax collection because uh, some exemptions on government corporations were lifted at the time. And the law also provided that any additional tax imposed uh, should go to the OPSF. Now, the claims against the OPSF, these uh, were the reimbursements to oil companies for their uh, import cost increases uh, because of exchange rate adjustments and world price movements. The price setting was set every two months. So in two months time, price prices uh, were stable. Then uh, the design evolved. There were changes uh, in 1985 and 1987. So in 1985, um, cost savings by companies uh, due to uh, price changes, market forces, and the ad valorem tax changes, these were considered contributions to the OPSF. And uh, in 1987, the contributions were expanded further by including the positive cost differentials uh, between the cost fixed by the regulator, uh, the, 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 the costs that uh, were allowed to be charged, no? and then the actual import cost by the oil companies. And the utilization was also expanded by including uh, as reimbursables the under recoveries of uh, the oil companies during the regulatory reset periods of two months. Then eventually, uh, policymakers uh, realized that the uh, there were frequent occurrence of uh, deficits or mismatches between payments and claims. And uh, this required um, subsidies uh, through the general fund, through the national budget. And then at the same time, um, needed investments and services were not coming, especially for island provinces and the municipalities. So we needed investments greater than those being provided by the so-called big three oil companies at that time. The big three were Petron, Shell, and Caltex. So the regulation was uh, first introduced in 1996 through RA 8180. However, the Supreme Court declared this as un unconstitutional and uh, cited uh, three uh, provisions uh, which uh, were deemed un 
um, unconstitutional. The 4% tariff differential between imported crude oil and refined petroleum products, the minimum inventory requirement for oil companies serving uh, as barrier to entry for new companies, and then the definition of uh, predatory pricing, which uh, was unsatisfactory. You know, it, it won't uh, deter anti-competitive behavior. So the legislators addressed the constitutionalities, uh, constitutionality issues, and by 1998, uh, they came up with RA 8479, which fully deregulated the downstream oil industry and abolished the OPSF. Now, every time there's oil, cri oil crisis, uh, we see a temptation to reverse the deregulation policy. You, you'll see that if you will revisit uh, the local news in 2008, you know, when speculative uh, bubble was uh, building up. In 2011, when supply shortages occurred due to the Arab Spring movements. In 2017 to 2018, due to the high demand growth uh, prior to the oil crash uh, in, in 2018, that's uh, when the oil crash ha happened. And then in October 2021, when um, demand, uh, economic demand jumped, uh, when uh, COVID-induced mobility restrictions were relaxed. And then recently, due to the Russia-Ukraine war, and along with the uh, revisiting of the uh, deregulation, there are also calls for the revival of the OPSF. Okay, now what are the risks of reviving the OPSF? So we're looking at the risks um, based on our historical experience. First is the risk of mismatches between sources of and claims against the price stabilization fund. So we've seen that uh, instead of being self-financing, the OPSF had to receive transfers from the national budget. And in 1990, uh, it, the transfer was uh, uh, huge. Uh, it was five billion and equivalent uh, at present to 25.59 billion. Uh, it was uh, uh, through Republic Act uh, 6592. Another risk is the temptation to use the OPSF for other purposes. Now, this this is not uh, unique to Philippine policymakers. Policymakers in other countries. Uh, uh, are also tempted that way. You'll see in one country that uh, uh, the price stabilization fund um, was used for, for a different purpose uh, in, in one of my uh, uh, succeeding slides. Uh, an example in our case is uh, in 1992, uh, legislators allowed the use of the OPSF for the payment of a capital stock subscription to the National Power Corporation, and that's uh, through the enactment of uh, RA 7639. Another risk is wavering political will. So how sure are we that uh, our policymakers will uh, really implement the needed price increases, especially when the magnitude was large, uh, which uh, uh, becomes necessary when our world uh, uh, oil prices are large. And uh, in fact, that happened uh, in 1994, na, the government even backpedaled on price increases uh, it planned to implement. It was uh, uh, recorded in a, uh, a report by the International Monetary Fund, and that contributed uh, to the further erosion of the OPSF. Another risk is the uh, possible occurrence of uh, lengthy legal challenges to the OPSF credits and payments, and uh, this can be costly as um, illustrated in uh, the case of uh, Shell's uh, government government uh, 1991 claim that Shell had underpayment of uh, contributions. So there were uh, back and forth uh, claims and counterclaims between the government and Shell. And then uh, in it was only in 2008 that the uh, final ruling was um, uh, given by the Supreme Court and uh, the government uh, lost the case. Okay, another risk is um, the possibility of uh, unintended uh, consequences. And uh, here uh, in the OPSF experience, so we had the unintended uh, effects of price distortion wherein 
the uh, use of carbon intensive diesel was intensified uh, incentivized and um it, this is because uh, the way the opsf was designed at that time the government set the regulated price for premium gasoline higher than the computed price uh, in order to keep the diesel price low. So purportedly, this is to help um, sector sectors such as the public transport sector, uh, agriculture, and uh, fisheries. So in effect, there was cross subsidization. But uh, this encouraged consumers to shift to diesel, which uh, emits more carbon, so including uh, SU, the SUV riding public. Now, um, some may argue, but uh, hey, there are still uh, a fuel price stabilization funds in other countries. Yes, that is true. But there are only a few of them that uh, remained with the fuel price stabilization funds. Uh, we can, we've counted them and only four remaining. Uh, perhaps there are more, but uh, uh, based on our rigorous uh, research, so we, we've looked uh, even at a uh, loss in uh, their own national languages, and we 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 uh, translated uh, the national laws to to check uh, how whether uh, the uh, fuel price stabilization funds are uh, designed uh, uh, similar to the concept of uh, you know um, uh, OPSF or or something close to it. And um, if we have uh, missed something, that's probably because the, uh, due to um, an availability of, uh, of uh, easily translatable uh, national laws. But uh, we've counted four. So first is Thailand. Th Thailand established its oil fund in 1979. So uh, by the way, uh, we excluded uh, no, uh, exporting countries. So we focus on uh, net oil importing countries because uh, uh, for obvious an obvious reason, the exporting countries uh, can very well afford um, fuel price stabilization funds for their consumers. So first, Thailand. Thailand established its oil fund in 1979, and it's uh, now known as the Oil Fuel Fund. So it, it, it was used to stabilize domestic prices, but the expense of having a deficit. So para pareho, almost of, uh, all of them have deficit or not not almost, but all of all the four have deficits. So as of March 2022, uh, Thailand's fund is incurring loans of 20 million uh, Thai baht and to support the spikes in subsidies due to the Russia-Ukraine war. Vietnam, in 2009, uh, the Vietnamese government passed uh, this law setting aside price valorization funds. Initially, um, that was successful, but uh, the funds have not been able to prevent price increases uh, for oil in the country. And in fact, uh, in the last year, it registered a negative balance of 600 billion Vietnamese dong. Malawi. Malawi established its uh, price stabilization fund in 2004. But uh, it was reported to be impotent in stabilizing oil prices and preventing oil supply shortages. And in fact, uh, the government was criticized for using the fund for another purpose, for a purpose different from uh, petroleum price stabilization. It was used to fund the purchase of maize or corn uh, into 2016. In Chile, so in Latin American countries, um, price stabilization funds uh, were uh, removed, uh, except for Chile. Uh, some uh, amount uh, has remained, but uh, that's only uh, very small, and it's dedicated for household consumed kerosene. So the, the, the funds established in 1991 helped mitigate uh, drastic price increases. No? Uh, so only a small portion remained, uh, but uh, the uh, keeping of this fund necessitated uh, or keeping this fund functional necessitated the transfer of money from other funds, such as uh, when uh, seven billion dollars uh, of uh, copper funds were transferred to the oil fund in two thousand eight. No, so uh, so it's a bit 
uh, no, uh, similar to us, um, to, to our case, no, no, we're using, uh, na, or we use non-OPSF fund. So we use the national budget. In their case, they use the, the copper fund uh, to subsidize the oil fund. Now, let's uh, focus on understanding the premise and in and promises of the regulation because uh, this uh, will help um, and let's focus our if we are going to have information campaign let's let's uh, focus our information campaign on on uh, making the public understand the premise and promises of the regulation so that uh, uh, the temptation to backslide on reforms uh, could be lessened. Um, price regulation, the first premise is that price regulation is not effective because uh, external events that led to price spikes and crashes are usually major world events. And it's difficult for a small importing country like the Philippines to, to maintain uh, prices. No, it's, uh, it's costly. And besides, there are less distortionary and more effective uh, instruments for uh, mitigating the adverse uh, consequences of uh, high world uh, prices. So let's uh, uh, look at this uh, graph. No? This is an illustration of uh, major world events from the 1860s uh, to the present. And uh, you can see that uh, even during the uh, 2010 to 19 uh, period, uh, it's the, in terms of real prices. You no, know, the the levels are similar to the 1860s uh, Pennsylvania oil boom, but we survived and uh, without a price stabil stabilization fund. Another, uh, uh, now uh, let's look at the premises of the regulation. The, the reg oil industry, the regulation law did not promise to lower prices. It never promised uh, low prices or it never promised um, uh, stopping the price increases. Instead, it set as a policy goal, a truly competitive market under a regime of fair prices. So two keywords. Com competition and fair pricing. So since the 1998 deregulation, greater competition in the market has been achieved. And uh, we needed that. We needed to improve quality of petroleum products and expand the oil industry coverage to serve underserved areas, you know, island provinces and island municipal municipalities. So if uh, you will notice from the the uh, market share of the big three uh, from 1998 to 2021. So in 1998, they, they, they dominated um, the oil downstream oil industry. Uh, but in 2021, the share of the big three um, uh, is no smaller at 49%. Uh, uh, and uh, in fact, there are now 400 firms participating in the downstream oil industry with a cumulative investment of 209.5 billion. On fair pricing, so fair prices uh, means not uh, too high to the benefit of our producers and to the detriment of consumers, nor too low uh, to the detriment of uh, uh, non-oil consumers, because that will involve uh, subsidies. No? Um, fair, so fair pricing is what's promised by the, the regulation law. And there had been three independent uh, reviews uh, in 2005 by an independent uh, review committee uh, formed by the DOE in 2008 um, through uh, the SGV and the University of Asia and the Pacific study team and uh, in 2012 through an independent review committee uh, formed by the DOE again. So all of these uh, three uh, reviews found that profit margins of firms were reasonable and in fact the return on equity 
um, the average return on equity by firms uh, even declined after the regulation. Now, uh, what are the possible policy responses? And first, uh, before before discussing the policy responses, uh, let me emphasize that uh, the highly recommended strategy is uh, reform durability. You no, know? and how do we do that? Lack in reforms. We lack in reforms, and that's true for for other uh, sectors uh, wherein there there are temptations to have policy reforms. Uh, reversal. So lack in reforms. Lack in reforms by making commitments to stay the course through legislative amendments and uh, supplemental issuances that cement and improve rather than reverse the reforms. So uh, here uh, I'll be discussing um, uh, policies on min minimum inventory requirement, retail price unbundling, and strategic oil reserves. So for the minimum inventory requirement, so you may recall that uh, this was struck down as un unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 1997 because a barrier to entry for new firms at the time. But note that the current environment is markedly different from what the Supreme Court appreciated in 1997. Besides, the DOE is already um, implementing uh, the minimum inventory requirement, uh, but through department circulars, no. Uh, what's needed is to uh, legislate uh, this uh, policy uh, because uh, it will guarantee continuous domestic supply, discourage fly-by-night operators, and th those are uh, reasons that uh, were um, considered by our, our policy makers in. Uh, 1996 no so this time uh, this will not be considered as uh, providing unfair advantage to uh, existing players because the industry now enjoys uh, greater competition than before another uh, proposal is uh, retail price and bundling and this is in fact uh, contained in uh, house bill 10823 so the aim there is to separate petroleum prices uh, based on its components such as landed cost, port charges, refining cost, storage cost, handling costs, marketing costs, and transshipment costs. So the objective is to promote transparency and fair pricing and to help spot uh, anti-competitive practices such as predatory pricing or even uh, smuggling. Now, this is currently being opposed by industry players, and I'm glad that uh, we have uh, a discussion from the private sector. Uh, uh, he may be able to uh, elucidate uh, more on this. Strategic oil reserves. This is uh, another uh, possible policy response. And uh, note that uh, this is uh, uh, already being implemented uh, in our a neighbor. So Asian neighbors with the strategic oil reserves uh, include uh, the, the advanced countries are uh, Japan, South Korea, China also has a strategic oil reserve. And then our closer neighbors, um, Thailand and Taiwan, they also have strategic oil reserves. Now government uh, participation in uh, holding oil reserves, uh, I think may help generate uh, industry consensus on uh, compliance uh, with the minimum inventory requirement. As long as it is clear that the government uh, owned oil stocks are strictly for contingencies and uh, not meant to compete with the private sector. So, uh, in the during oil supply disruptions, uh, it is in everybody's interest to avoid economic losses. So, the private sector, the industry player should be interested in that also you know, uh, and uh, interested to ensure a critical level of supply is uh, available. And that is through uh, an ag aggregate strategic reserve composed of uh, their um, stockpile through the minimum inventory requirement and the government stockpile through um, a, a uh, policy on uh, government holding of uh, strategic oil reserves. Now the proposal 
is for the uh, PNOC to do the stockpiling. It's not uh, yet articulated in the National Energy Plan that was prepared in 2002, but uh, the PIDS uh, uh, got an update from uh, the, the uh, DOE that the National Energy Plan is being updated. Now, there are other ways forward. Targeted subsidy program, that's already an existing policy, so it's not something new, but there could be improvements. And then energy efficiency programs, there are already existing policies on this. And then diversification of uh, energy supply sources, that's already uh, uh, a long-standing uh, strategy that uh, always appears in the Philippine Energy Plan. Now for um, the targeted subsidy, before discussing that, let's uh, look at the um, fuel uh, excise tax suspension uh, proposal. So it's, um, it, it's, uh, it was proposed uh, by legislators and uh, opposed by the Department of Finance. And uh, this is because um, uh, and, and the PIDS agrees with this. This is because it would result in fiscal revenue losses. No? And uh, uh, in 2022, it's estimated to be 105.9 billion. And uh, look at this table, table one. Look at uh, the richest 10%, the 10th decile. So they're consuming or they're spending uh, 34.9 uh, their fuel spending is 34.34% 34 .34 of the total. The next decile, the ninth decile, 16.27%. Uh, so the, uh, the richest 20%, uh, their, their expenditure, their spending on fuel is uh, about uh, 50% of the total uh, fuel expenditure. Compare that with the poorest 10%. Their fuel spending is 1.39%. The second poorest decile, 2.67%. So, so the, the poorest 20%, um, the, their total fuel spending is only close to 4% of the total fuel uh, expenditure in the economy. So that means those who can very well afford fuel price increases will stand to benefit more from fuel price declines if we will suspend the fuel excise taxes. So in lieu of uh, fuel excise tax suspension, it's better to target the, those who are most affected by fuel price increases and target them through subsidies. So that's the better option. But uh, there need to be improvements in the timing, coordination, and efficiency in distribution as well as the generousness of the amounts, given uh, the issues that we've been hearing about uh, programs like Pantawid Pasada and the uh, delays in the uh, programs, fuel subsidy programs for the agriculture and fishery sector. Uh, another existing policy that we have is the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act of 2019. So that's needed for demand management. And this can help mitigate the impacts of uh, oil price peaks. But uh, the COVID-19 pandemic made um, private sector compliance uh, extra challenging. So rather than spend uh, on uh, technology that uh, will uh, make them comply with the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act of 2019, they, they, they'd rather spend on uh, keeping their businesses whole. So the government and financing partners should help facilitate a firm's transition toward energy efficient options. And uh, for the long term, we need to have diverse diversification of uh, energy supply resources. So we need to improve the enforcement of uh, existing renewable energy related laws. Uh, we need to support this uh, through um, strategies like uh, having an ancillary services market in the electricity market. And uh, we also have to uh, be serious in uh, pursuing 
uh, the activities and strategies related to uh, indigenous oil and gas exploration and development. So the Philippine Energy Plan 2020 to 2040 has declarations on this, but uh, earnestness in plans must be matched by mm -hmm. resoluteness in actions. Now, as uh, we have seen from um, the analysis, there are two major strands of uh, policy thinking uh, that are emerging. Um, uh, first, reinstate the OPSF, reversing the downstream oil industry deregulation in the process. And second, uh, rewrite the industry rules through such amendments as uh, price unbundling and uh, minimum inventory requirement. Uh, with the latter contributing to strategic uh, stockpiling. Um, policymakers should assess which of these two is more tolerable for the industry uh, players. And the uh, industry players, on the other hand, should be interested in measures that uh, will lead to reform durability rather than reform reversal. And I think more importantly, the effects on the poor should be well assessed by both policymakers and the industry players so that uh, previous and uh, upcoming reforms would be more acceptable to the public. So we should pursue development objectives in a way that does not burden the poor. So that's the better approach. And uh, reviving the OPSF, I think, will be anti-poor in at least three respects. First, given that it is usually the rich who consume a higher volume of petroleum, the subsidy from the poor will disproportionately benefit the rich more than the poor. Second, reviving the OPSF will likely result in the national government having to bail out the special fund using the general fund, the, the national budget. So displacing funding for anti-poverty programs in the process. And third, because there are many players now in the downstream oil industry, administering the OPSF will be very costly. And the huge costs will be disproportionately be borne by the poor. So I think programs on targeted assistance to the poor is preferable to the OPSF. So thank you for this uh, opportunity for us in PIDS to contribute to uh, socioeconomic development through policy research. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Hadora. That was uh, a really um, clear and uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, thank you also for your final uh, remarks concerning the um, possible effects on the poor, um, supposing um, the uh, the proposal for the uh, revival of the OPSF will push through. Maraming salamat, and now we will hear more from Dr. Uh, Navarro during the open forum. So, friends, we invited three experts who will uh, react on the study's findings and recommendations and also share their insights on how the country can address this ongoing uh, dilemma of uh, rising oil prices. So, first, let us hear what our Department of Energy has to say about the issue. And we are honored to have with us Attorney Rino Abad, Director of the Oil Industry Management Bureau of the Department of Energy. Attorney Abad oversees and supervises the formulation, implementation of policies, plans, programs, and regulations on the activities of the downstream oil and natural, ga and natural gas industries. Uh, his office likewise monitors, evaluates, and recommends policies, industry guidelines, rules, and regulations towards the development and promotion of downstream oil and natural gas industries. Director Abad, sir, the floor is now yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and uh, our thanks to the presentation of Ma'am Navarro. And um, it's actually very comprehensive. And uh, based on uh, the presentation, uh, there were actually the points uh, taken out in, in that uh, presentation were actually uh, almost identical or uh, very consistent to the uh, peer review on fossil fuel made by APIC uh, last uh, 2016 uh, in direct coordination with the Department of Energy. And uh, earlier to that, of course, was a, a global study made uh, in 20, 
2013 by the World Bank. And almost all the points were actually uh, pointing to those uh, that were, were pointed out by Ma'am Navarro. But uh, I would like to emphasize the fact, and uh, we heard this uh, during the discussion on the passage of the train law, uh, basically on the discussion on the excise tax. And uh, it was confirmed in the 2016 study of APIC, and now as presented also by Ma'am Navarro. Uh, and I would like to quote here that, uh, uh, well, just uh, a difference in the figure, but in the APIC study, uh, it was also provided for that uh, in the findings, the highest income groups and the middle class, uh, which actually use uh, uh, cars and air conditioning of these cars, uh, is around 92.8% uh, as compared to the lo lowest income groups, which only um, uh, uh, amounted to around 7.2%. Uh, so we have a mention of around 20%, that's quite high. But, uh, uh, you know, the trend is actually uh, quite similar. Uh, the one that is uh, getting the, uh, the most use of the fuel are actually those that can pay. Uh, so the intent really of the OPSF in stabilizing the price is supposed to be directed to, the, to those that are vulnerable, or mostly the, the, those that cannot really pay and cope up with the increases in prices. So uh, again, uh, other points uh, pointed out by uh, uh, Ma'am Navarro is the uh, fiscal harm. Uh, in the end, if uh, we're, we're actually dealing with a, a very volatile price, it becomes disruptive for the uh, budgetary requirement of the government uh, because, uh, of course, uh, our budgetary revenues are uh, most likely fixed uh, for, for a particular time frame uh, depending on the on the passage of a particular law uh, collecting those revenues. And here comes this uh, vo very volatile price that even changes in terms of trading prices on a daily basis. So it becomes very disruptive. And uh, almost always, as pointed out also in, the, in, in this presentation, uh, almost always the, uh, all of the, all of the uh, cited government from the Philippines, Thailand, uh, have reflected uh, fiscal harm uh, in the end. Uh, in maintaining this fund. So, uh, but uh, uh, again, uh, in support of those findings, they, they're actually consistent with the World Bank study in 2013, in 2016 study, basically, specifically to the Philippines by the a by APIC. But uh, we'd like also to add that, uh, well, we support those, uh, what have been provided in the latter part of the presentation, of the what we call the targeted relief program. Um, we're not doing it now, and we also aligned with, the, with that uh, uh, policy concept that uh, 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 a particular fund could be allocated towards uh, this uh, more vulnerable uh, sector, like the PUV, the public utility transport sector, and of course, the farmers and fishermen. As is now, uh, as are now provided for in the 2022 Appropriations Act, we have already around 2.5 billion pesos allocated to the public transport, and around 500 million pesos uh, allocated to the farmers and fishermen. But the problem is, uh, if we compare the, the well, anyway, I'm just getting the fund uh, in in my mind uh, that uh, what what we have in excise tax, for example, is an average price of. Uh, an average uh, amount of, uh, well, 10 pesos for gasoline, 6 pesos for diesel, 5 pesos uh, excise taxes rate for, for, uh, for uh, kerosene. And this amounted to around 105, as mentioned, billion pesos annual uh, projected uh, coll collectibles uh, for 2022. Uh, but these are just amount in a range of uh, six, 5, 6 to 10. Uh, my worry, our only concern is that the, uh, well, for the period only from January to, to date, we have, we have now an increased uh, uh, price of, of around, um, we have now an increased price of around, uh, more, for diesel, it's more than 30 pesos. So just imagine how, if you compare the 105 billion uh, with those figures, 5, 6, uh, 10, uh, excise tax rates for the gasoline. Uh, we're talking here about 30 pesos increase 
uh, for diesel. So if we're talking about the 2.5 billion support uh, as what we call the targeted relief program, uh, that is, uh, well, th that would be relatively uh, small uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to this 30 peso increase now of the diesel. And we have probably we could revisit the 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 allocation um, uh, 30 pesos is too high even compared to the to the 10 5 6 10 pesos uh, uh, collect collective uh, collected uh, as is excise tax for for uh, from petroleum products which amounted to around 105 so uh, the 500 million pesos would be also be in my in my opinion would be too small relatively small for for the uh, targeted relief, relief program for farmers and fishermen. So with that, uh, um, we are now uh, aligned as, as pointed out in the report. We have now the, the proper policy for this targeted relief program. It was actually, they were actually implemented since 2018. Uh, LTFRB, Pantawid uh, Pasada, fuel discount just this year, 2022, but they are now there. So we could uh, uh, either expand the coverage to other sectors, or we can we could increase at the same time uh, the targeted relief, relief program, uh, as discussed earlier. Uh, that uh, they they might be uh, re relatively small, uh, but uh, at the same uh, at the same point we have confirmed that uh, we have also been into the policy uh, issuances for the oil strategic reserve. And uh, uh, the unbundling, uh, we have also this issued that issued that way back in 2018. Uh, unfortunately, there was a uh, uh, it's uh, it has been uh, the court uh, three courts were actually uh, have actually issued uh, injunction uh, for us uh, um, against us. So the Department of Energy uh, was not able to implement this unbundling. So as pointed out, those uh, mentions alternatives policy alternatives uh, were actually now uh, being implemented, uh, if not uh, uh, just uh, uh, sanctioned uh, or injunct uh, by the court. Uh, but uh, ultimately, we will find a way to for this to be implemented uh, in the end. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's enough for me. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be uh, part of this uh, discussion. And thank you very much, uh, Director Irene Obad of uh, Department of Energy. Uh, thank you, sir, for your reactions as well as your updates to um, updates on um, the implementation of existing policies uh, concerning the oil industry. So, friends, um, okay, at this point, uh, from the Department of Energy, let us go to the state-owned energy company of the country, the Philippine National National. Um, oil uh, company or PNOC and we are honored to have Mr. Jesus Cristino Posadas, the President and Chief Executive of Officer of PNOC since February of this year. Prior to his current role, Engineer Posadas served as Senior Undersecretary of the DOE and was largely involved in the establishment of DOE's Department Circular on Energy Efficiency as part of the implementation of the Energy Efficiency and Conver uh, Conservation Act. Uh, this was um, uh, tackled by um, by Dr. Navarro in her presentation. So prior to this, um, engineer uh, Posadas was part of various energy-related corporations and also worked at San Miguel Corporation where he obtained his vast experience in supply and procurement systems. Sir, the floor is now yours. Thank you. No, I just wanted to uh, point out some uh, informa background information as well as uh, we'll be talking from the perspective of the Philippine National Oil Company. But first, we will characterize the energy sector as uh, VUCA. In other words, it's volatile, it is uncertain, it is complex, and it is ambiguous. And uh, the, the uh, energy sector is uh, filled with global industrial players. In other words, large multinationals, governments, OPEC, 
and even OPEC plus countries. Then we go to the Philippine situation. The Philippines is significantly dependent on importation, which is about 50% of the total energy supply. Uh, and the imported resources is, as far as oil is concerned, it is 100% uh, uh, essentially 100% uh, uh, importation dependent. And coal is about 17%. Our uh, indigenous energy resources is 32% uh, renewable energy, 7% not gas, and we have 11% coal that is indigenous. Then we have uh, the vulnerable sectors, the public transport, the par farmers, and fisher folk. Then we have the landscape, the uh, local landscape, landscape which is the uh, deregulated privatized uh, sector and where if we have to characterize the government intervention government is marginalized and minimized in its participation in the oil industry government does not have sufficient intervention power to address oil price affordability in other words uh, addressing the mitigation of oil price increases and it is also uh, does not have sufficient intervention in ensuring oil supply security in other words addressing severe oil supply disruptions as a reaction to the paper we agree on continuing the direct income transfer for example the Pantawin Pavilion Filipino program to target the economic process as a separate poverty alleviation measure, which also helps mitigate inflation, inflation from high petroleum prices. Specific to the PNOC, PNOC family that, that is composed of the PNOC PNOC RC, and PNOC Exploration Corporation, it, the, the family should have the flexibility to address the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous nature of the global and local oil and gas industry landscape, from upstream resource development, downstream operations, distribution, and retail supply. Number two, PNOC should have the same number provided to all GOCCs operating in their own, operating with their own corporate funds without depending on the new GAA or the Government Appropriations Act, but still accountable to COLA and funds utilization reporting to Congress. It should be flexible to undertake the program, pro projects, programs, and plans without being subjected to congressional uh, in Congress imposed priorities and DBM project competition for funds. Number three, the NRC should be able to participate in areas where private sector is unwilling, unable, and disinterested to, in, to undertake, for example, the strategic crude oil reserve for conversion to petroleum products as and when required during severe supply disruptions. The targeted fuel relief measures, for example, this is where uh, I think we will, we will differ from the oil, oil uh, uh, stabilization fund because we intend to do the diesel fuel stockpiling, which will be built during the better, better markets. In other words, when the price, prices are down and released as contingency price discounted safety net fuel for affected, affected sectors. For example, the, the public transport, police, military, the NPC spot for rural electrification, and for example, electric power reserve capacities and the development of advanced technologies, for example, hydrogen and small modular nuclear reactors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Engineer Jesus uh, Posadas of the PNOC. Okay, so um, Okay, from, uh, from the government, okay, let's jump to uh, the private sector. And uh, for our last reaction, we'll hear from the Philippine Institute of Petroleum, which is a business association composed of the major downstream oil companies in the Philippines and its members are Shell, Petron, Chevron, 
Otal, PTTN um, is Lagas. It was created in 1996 primarily to help the government during the advent of the deregulation. Today, it serves as an avenue where companies can discuss common issues that confront the industry. And no less than the executive director of PIP, Mr. Rafael uh, Rafi Kapintin, will share his take on the call to revive the OPSF or consider other causes of action. Prior to his current role at PIP, Executive Director Kapintin has worked in a multinational oil company in the Philippines for 25 years and he has extensive experience in the downstream oil industry, specifically in retail, pricing and economics, marketing and operations. So Rafi, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Sheila, and good afternoon to everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for inviting us to react to the study conducted by Dr. Navarro on the <clears throat> OPSF and the downstream oil industry. Uh, okay, <clears throat> as, as mentioned, my name is Rafi <clears throat> and I'm the executive director of the PIP. Now, <clears throat> let, let me begin the, on, on the matter pertaining to the OPSF. The, the studies look back into the history and the negative effect of the OPSF is very exhaustive. Thus, I will not dwell on it any further as it will not do any justice to the research already conducted. Suffice it to say, the three of our members were participants in that era and all agree that the frequent changes in the fund's rules and deviation from its intended purpose led to it not accomplishing its objectives and subsequently leading to the misuse of the funds. Uh, we maintain that the government's money is better spent elsewhere in delivering essential social services. Okay? Let me instead put focus on the proposed amendments to the deregulation law, which was referenced to House Bill 10823, which by the way was approved by the House Committee on Energy without giving the industry the benefit of being heard. Okay, first off, increasing the minimum inventory requirement or the MIR as we call it. So the House bill says that it wants to increase it to 30 days. The newspaper today says that they want it in 60 days. So we don't know. So increasing MIR at best will help assure us that supply of fuel in the Philippines will not be disrupted. As you know, as mentioned by Chairman Jess, the, the Philippines imports nearly 100% of its crude oil and finished petroleum products. As such, we are subject to the volatility of global prices, which is driven primarily by supply and demand, which in turn is affected by OPEC production quotas, weather, seasonal factors, and geopolitical tensions. Now, Having said that, there are three factors that needs to be understood so that expectations are managed. Number one, increasing MIR will not lead to lower fuel prices. Some people maintain that increasing MIR will result in lower prices as it serves as a buffer to volatile global prices. <clears throat> this is not true as the downstream oil industry in the Philippines do not practice inventory-based pricing. Inventory-based pricing is simply pricing your products according to the cost of that current inventory. Oil players will import products at different times and different parcel sizes. And when you price that according to inventory, it will cause swings in supply and demand per company and per location that is going to be very messy. Additionally, it is also not reflective, <clears throat> excuse me, of the true cost of the product. Now, what is practiced in the Philippine downstream oil industry is a pricing condition, which is called week minus one. Average trading prices for the current week, as reported in Min of Platts, Singapore, is compared to the average trading prices of the previous week. And the difference, among others, is reflected the week after. Now, this pricing practice is common in many countries and is recognized to be transparent and reflective of the prevailing global price of the commodity. 
Now, other pricing conditions are day minus one, where you change prices every day. I don't think we are ready for that. Or even month minus one, where you change prices every month. Okay? Number two, increasing MIR, whether to 30 days or 60 days, at any given time for all products in all locations may be impossible for all players to implement. This will involve massive capital infusion for additional land, storage tanks, infrastructure, and the cost of inventory itself. Land or free space in a terminal is very scarce and may be ex very expensive. Now, construction of tanks is equally expensive. A construction of a storage tank will range between 2 million to 4 million pesos per kilo barrel. That is only 159,000 liters. Now, oil companies will be hard pressed to fund this. And I'm afraid the added cost or the added cost of investment, which may be perceived as an unnecessary investment, may find its way to the, to the prevailing prices that are passed on to the consumer. Okay? Number three, I think already mentioned by Dr. Navarro, increasing MIR, again, for all products in all storage locations, will raise barriers to entry and discourage investments. Now, potential new entrants, uh, startups, or even big players may be hard pressed to come up with financing for this. And it will discourage investments and limit competition. Okay? So, my conclusion on the idea of increasing MIR. The, the current MIR of 30 days for refiners, 15 days for importers, and 7 days for LPG players is already sufficient. As a matter of fact, many oil players already exceed this. Take note that majority of the oil imported by the Philippines is within 5 to 10 days sailing time only. Okay. Now, oil is a commodity that you can readily buy. You can readily buy this. You just need to be prepared or we just need to be prepared to pay for its prevailing cost and premium because many countries would also like to buy it. Now, moving on to oil price unbundling. Very hot topic these days. As rightfully mentioned, this issue is sub judice. Thus, I'm afraid I cannot discuss it in detail. Dr. Navarro, I would love to discuss this with you, but I have been advised not to. Suffice it to say that the oil industry will continue to oppose this, as this will be a form of price control that is inconsistent with the regulation and the supposed objective of promoting price transparency. If you want historical reference, then you can make reference to the old Energy Regulatory Board, wherein oil companies will need to justify their costs and propose price movements before a panel of regulators. Now, let me just add one thing. Some lawmakers, policymakers, and government executives argue that if power companies can unbundle their prices, then so can the oil companies. Well, no, because it is because the certain power companies are a natural monopoly. And as such, they should really unbundle their prices because they do not have competitors. The Philippine downstream oil industry is not a monopoly. As rightfully highlighted already, there are more than 30 oil players already. The so-called big three is no more. There's no more big three. More than half of the market is already controlled by the independent oil companies. Okay? On the creation of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, we agree with uh, Dr. Navarro that this needs further examination. Uh, we definitely need to learn from our neighbors. As you can recall, the U.S. released inventory from their SPR. It only lowered prices for a week. Then after that, it went back to global prices. Market forces will really dictate it. This will entail massive government investments and also expertise on how to administer it. In closing, 
if there is something inherently wrong or flawed in our oil deregulation law, then by all means, let's fix it or strengthen it, as you mentioned. Do take note, however, that every time prices of fuel goes up or there are significant geopolitical events, the clamor and the noise to amend the deregulation law comes alive. However, when prices are relatively stable or less volatile, there is no talk about it. So, is this a knee-jerk reaction? Let us be wary of knee-jerk reactions and raising expectations due to populist de demands. We now see healthy competition among all of the oil players. Tax collection from the industry is at an all-time high. The big three doesn't exist anymore. There are price and promotional wars all over. You go around now, there are many price discounting. We enjoy better and safer facilities and services. We also enjoy quality products. So simply put, we are spoiled for choice, and that is your deregulation. Now, we all need to seriously consider whether amending the law or reviving OPSF as a reaction to global high prices will do more harm than good. Uh, Ms. Gwen, can you share my slide, please? So I'd like to leave all of you with this. The key takeaways. Reviving the OPSF, didn't we learn our lessons? They say that past behavior predicts future behavior. Number two, amending the deregulation law. Is there something inherently wrong or flawed in it? Consider if doing so will do more harm than good. Increasing MIR. Consider A, can the oil companies afford this? B, potential impact to the industry as it might raise barriers to entry. Also, let us set proper expectations. Supply security, maybe, yes. Lowering prices, no. Price unbundling, again, subjudice, but oil industry will oppose this. This is a form of price control that will reserve, uh, that will reverse the regulation. SPR, will the government be committed to funding and administering it? Maybe it needs more examination and study. That's it. Thank you very much, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Rafi, the um, PIP. Uh, we really appreciate, Sir, your candid uh, remarks and uh, the, the, the takeaways you uh, mentioned, such as your nuanced uh, perspective on the uh, on uh, increasing the MIR and why uh, it, is, it would be difficult for uh, the uh, the uh, um, oil companies to um, implement uh, the increase in, in the MIR. Okay, so friends, uh, at this point, we have further reactions and insights of our discussions. And this time, we would like to hear from you. So we have mm -hmm. come to the next part of our webinar, which is the open forum. But before that, let us have a short break by running a poll. And this poll is open to our WebEx participants and viewers on Facebook. So after hearing the insights and arguments of our four speakers, what are your thoughts about the uh, OPSF? Okay, so our uh, poll question is flashed on the screen. Are you in favor of bringing back the OPSF? Yes or no? Okay, so uh, we are giving you 10 seconds to answer it. Okay, so um, while you are uh, thinking it through, if you have any questions on our presenters, uh, do um, um, use our uh, chat box. Okay, so again, are you in favor of bringing back the OPSF? Yes or no? Gwen? Um, 10 more seconds. Okay. Okay, so for um, our viewers on Facebook, you are also very much welcome to participate in the discussion. Just send your questions by typing them on the comment section, okay? Okay, the poll has ended. So at this point, I invite our four speakers uh, to the open forum, Dr. Adora Navarro, um, Attorney uh, Rino Abad, uh, Chairman uh, Engineer, uh, uh, Chess Posadas and Mr. Rafi uh, Kapimpin. Okay, let us uh, now go to our questions. Okay, 
So, okay. Mm -hmm. We have a question. Uh, this is not actually a question, but a comment from uh, Dr. Ruel Briones of PIDS. And this is uh, addressed to uh, Dr. Uh, Navarro. Uh, he said uh, he doesn't think that strategic reserves or st uh, the, the uh, proposal for having a strategic reserve will work because price is set at the world market, not uh, the domestic where the reserve will be released. He is asking for your thoughts on this, um, Adora, Dr. Navarro. Please go ahead. Yes, yes uh, thank you for that comment, uh, Dr. Roel Briones. As uh, I mentioned, uh, it's not for uh, uh, competing with the private industry. So, and by implication, it's not for uh, price stabilization. And uh, that's also discussed in the discussion paper. Uh, strategic oil reserves. Um, it's uh, for energy security and uh, to ensure that uh, uh, in times of uh, very severe oil supply uh, disruption, uh, we will have enough supply. And uh, the strategic oil reserve that uh, uh, should be considered cons consists of uh, the industry held stockpile through the minimum inventory requirement when it comes to uh, the point wherein th that is already legislated and uh, the government uh, held a stockpile uh, when uh, the feasibility study uh, has been completed and uh, uh, it's proven that it's uh, um, affordable for the government and uh, administering uh, it is uh, designed well and uh, the, uh, the, I, I think that that will work for uh, ensuring uh, energy security and besides um, strategic petroleum, having strategic petroleum reserves as uh, a policy for countries is um, uh, already uh, being promoted by um, the International Energy Agency. And in fact, members of the IEA are required to have a strategic petroleum reserves that uh, is uh, worth uh, uh, 90 days of uh, uh, supply or 90 days of uh, imports, uh, import uh, requirements. And even non-IEA member countries are um, uh, pursuing a or are um, having strat strategic uh, petroleum uh, reserves. And uh, I think uh, it, as long as it's affordable for us and uh, administering it uh, will be designed well, uh, it's worth pursuing. So again, it's not meant to uh, stabilize prices. Uh, I think the U.S. experience where um, uh, stocks were released from their uh, SPR uh, uh, and then uh, the prices uh, uh, were controlled uh, for only a few weeks, I, I think uh, it's, it's a misinterpretation. It's not meant to, to uh, maintain uh, prices at the same level it's not meant to stabilize prices it's meant to address a uh, severe oil supply uh, disruption because otherwise if no uh, st stocks were strategically released then prices would have been you know higher than uh, what uh, it it, it uh, was so that's the purpose of having a strategic reserve thank you very much uh, dr navarro now let us um go to um Director uh, Rino, sir, may we hear your thoughts about uh, the uh, remarks of uh, <laughs> okay, the remarks of Sir Rafi regarding the minimum inventory requirement and the price unbundling? Yes, uh, Ma'am Shi, I know, um, uh, most of the points uh, elucidated, elucidated by uh, Sir Rafi are are actually not not directly connected to the not directed to the to the problems that we are trying to cure uh, mm -hmm. in proposing the the requirements for MIR, uh, as pointed out by Mam Navarro, uh, this is not actually part of the uh, regulatory framework under the oil deregulation law or any other law in the Philippines. That's why we want to formalize it. We want to put it in the law so we could. Uh, um, uh, legally, by legal authority, we can implement this MIR, which is a security measure counterpart 
Uh, and this has been the practice of responsible nations and responsible oil companies within any nation to contribute in securing the supply. So this is not about the price. Uh, so we would like to emphasize that this is energy security as a counterpart of the oil companies, responsible oil companies in a responsible nation. Because ultimately, as pointed out, uh, at this point in time, we do not have a strategic petroleum reserve. All the fuels are actually uh, managed and, well, imported by the oil companies. And mind you, at this point in time, they're not, uh, the inventory level of these oil companies are not geared towards answering or responding to any, any, I would really mention, any supply disruption. So this is the case where we are now. These are, the inventories are really purely commercial inventories. The inventories that you use in the next week, in the next two weeks, and beyond that, you do not have any more supply. So while the country is gearing, gearing towards securing the supply of fuel as a responsible duty of any country to its citizen, we have noted that in other countries, it's always a combination of the responsibility between the government and the oil companies working or doing the business in the, inside that, that country. So this is really a combination, a complementary security of supply from both from the private sector and the government sector. Now, in the end, are these being wasted if we set the MIR into 30-day supply? Ultimately, are these being wasted? Of course not. They will, they will just maintain that supply and make do with a readjustment in the replenishment uh, sequence. Uh, if, if you're actually doing a, a one-time replenishment sequence in a month, probably you, what you would do to maintain the 30-day supply 30 day supply now would be you do a sequence of replenishment every 15 days just to maintain the products there at a certain level that that would not expose you immediately to any supply disruption and fuel supply mind you is always vulnerable on a daily basis major events are happening on a daily basis and supply is as always is always at stake so this is not a government, a sole government problem. This is everyone's problem. So that's the reason we need to have an MIR as a complementary to the government's plan to have a strategic petroleum reserve. Now on the unbundling, there is no provision in the circular that says about controlling the price. It only talks about submission and clarifying for transparency purposes what's happening with our price what are the these components that are driving the prices uh, be it increases be it de decreases there's no mention there about anything that says upon submission we will control your price that's a totally uh, misleading claim so again uh we would like to emphasize th this is uh we subscribe to su the sub sub judici uh, concept uh we cannot go into the details but I am compelled to say that the existing circular now doesn't contain any provision directed towards controlling the price as mentioned uh, many times in the position of the PIP. So let me clear that out so, so as not to mislead the public. So again, that's, uh, I think that's my take on the, on the comment of uh, the PIP. Thank you very much, uh, Director Le uh, Rino Abad. Okay, we will go back to that uh, Director Abad because there are still uh, questions uh, uh, directed to him later. Okay, let's go first to a question from Alvic Kosol, and this is for uh, Chairman for Engineer Posadas. Sir? Okay, 
uh, let me read uh, the question of Alvic. You mentioned about small modular reactors or SMR. Where are we now in terms of realizing that dream? What are the possible locations for SMRs in the country? Actually, Ding uh, William Mayor, who's watching us on Facebook, also has the same question. Go ahead, uh, Chairman Posadas. Well, this is uh, a topic or a subject matter of the uh, interagency nuclear uh, committee and uh, as, as we all know it, uh, the president has approved that uh, nuclear energy be part of the total energy mix of the country and uh, therefore we have started to study uh, how this will be implemented and one of the candidates for uh, a centralized nuclear plant are the what is called the small modular reactors. And there are candidate uh, locations already. This is by means of volunteer. It is not uh, dictated by government, but this is this is being uh, volunteered by, uh, for example, in uh, Sumu, as uh, the, the Secretary of Energy has already stated, and also in Cagayan. So these are volunteer locations where small modular reactors may be um, appropriate because it will just be uh, serving the electricity requirements of that particular area. Uh, this is very appropriate for island provinces actually. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chairman Posada. So, okay, we have a uh, question related to nuclear energy, and this one is from uh, Mr. Daniel Agustin, and this is for you, Dr. Navarro. What are your thoughts no, of uh, um, going into nuclear uh, energy as, uh, as a source of, you know, um, uh, power? So, uh, what do you think of this? Oh, we're on <laughs> We're, we're um, going outside the topic, but related to energy security, which is an objective of a uh, uh, oil industry deregulation. Well, um, nuclear energy is uh, uh, attracting attention as uh, uh, a form of uh, cleaner fuel, cleaner than fossil fuel. Uh, but of course, there are uh, issues uh, related to uh, waste disposal and this, uh, these are long-term issues. Uh, but it's not only the Philippines that uh, um, will face that problem. No? All the uh, uh, countries that are now um, th that now have nuclear energy in their mix uh, face that problem. Uh, but uh, technological solutions are continuously uh, being pursued and um, and uh, if ever the Philippines will include this definitely in the energy mix, then uh, uh, we uh, will have to um, uh, follow the developments and also uh, check how affordable uh, it can be for us to say export the ways and uh, use the technology of other countries. So, so there, there, there can be solutions uh, to that. Uh, I think the uh, main consideration is the cost and uh, the Philippines will have to be ready for that. Um, and uh, the SMR, uh, I think, uh, has, uh, is quite promising no? because uh, introducing nuclear energy uh, in the energy mix um, uh, the, the cost of that can be controlled uh, by uh, going small first, by uh, using uh, the SMR or small modular reactor technology first. Um, if uh, in our aspirations we include uh, having large uh, nuclear power plants, then uh, we should be ready uh, for, uh, we should be committed for the long term. We should be ready with uh, you know, um, the, the attendant cost and also the development of uh, our uh, 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 policy environment. And uh, in fact, uh, there is what's called a milestone approach that uh, will take uh, more than a decade. 
uh, it's uh, an approach prescribed by the International Atomic uh, uh, Agency. So we should, uh, like other countries, uh, follow that uh, milestone approach and uh, commit uh, for the long term uh, if ever we will decide to build large nuclear power plants. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Navarro. Okay, before we go to the next set of questions, let us look at the uh, result of our poll. Gwen, uh, could you please uh, flash it? Okay, the question is very simple, yet, uh, you know, mahirap uh, siyang sagutin. Are you in favor of bringing back the OPSF? Okay, so maraming nag-answer ng no. Okay, so mas marami ang hindi in favor of bringing back the OPSF. Uh, well, very good. I think na enlightened sila sa ating uh, discussion uh, today. Okay, so for those who uh, answered our uh, poll as a token of our appreciation, we will pick two names from our Facebook participants and also two from WebEx, and each of them will get a prize, and I will announce the winners before closing the webinar. Okay, let's go back to the other questions. Um, okay, we have um, some. Uh, okay, we have some questions again for our uh, for Director um, Abad of uh, uh, okay of the DOE, sir. This one again is from Albi Kosol regarding the diversification of energy sources. What is DOF's involvement in tapping the gas reserves? in Liguasan March. Uh, would you have any update on this, sir? And uh, from Facebook as well, Glenn Huego. An so, ano po ang win-win? Okay, let me read it uh, verbatim. Ano po ang win-win solution na naiisip ng Department of Energy? Sir, go ahead po. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this refers to the uh, upstream side of uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, program in tapping the indigenous supply of uh, oil and gas. Uh, of course, uh, the Department of Energy has a continuing program that I have to mention, it's a continuing program. It's a 24-7 program. Uh, there is a, a, a conventional uh, contracting rounds that's being implemented on a, for the entire year. Uh, and these are actually uh, the avenue by which uh, any interested investor uh, are able to uh, propose to the Department of Energy and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Department of Energy is able to uh, approve the, uh, the application for the development of, of a particular area uh, seen to be uh, containing uh, a, a potential source of oil and gas. Now, uh, I think uh, we just have to emphasize that in Liguasan Marsh, uh, these are areas that are within the uh, BARM. And uh, we know for a fact that uh, the uh, organic law uh, ha has to be uh, aligned with this. Uh, and in, uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that any decision to, to award, even just to award uh, areas for the development of this, of, this, uh, of this particular area has to go through with, uh, with the BARM uh, government. And uh, that's uh, where I think uh, I could share. Uh, I'm not into the upstream. Uh, I, I'm in the downstream, downstream. but, uh, but uh, as, uh, as we uh, encounter discussions uh, among uh, the different bureaus in the Department of Energy, we know for a fact that uh, we have a continuing program for the development of indigenous supply of uh, oil and gas. Uh, and uh, we are aware also that there is a, a government there that's uh, uh, where well, this location, uh, this is located within the uh, jurisdiction, territorial uh, jurisdiction. So we have to uh, really go through with that process uh, in, uh, uh, um, uh, provided for in the organic law. Um, well, for the second uh, uh, question, win-win. Uh, I think, uh, uh, as I pointed out later on, win-win in terms of probably the the. The audience is trying to emphasize uh, the, the balance between the, the government's intervention to the price and the uh, uh, well uncontrolled price uh, brought about by deregulation. Probably, I would think uh, that would be the, the the gist of the of the question. Now, here's the thing: uh, uh, we know for a fact that we cannot uh, afford, uh, as pointed out by Mam Navarro, 90 percent, in fact, 80 percent, as 
much lower than the study of uh, in 2016 by uh, by APIC. Uh, 80 percent would be the the much uh, uh, aff uh, affluent uh, uh, sector of the society are really consuming the biggest part of the fuel consumption, and only 20 percent are those that are supposed to be uh, given this uh, ideally subsidy uh, or ayuda or support. Mm -hmm. So. We cannot sustain that. So we are re rather uh, focused on the what we call the targeted relief program. As pointed mm -hmm. out earlier, uh, our recent uh, approval in the Appropriations Act, 2022 Appropriations Acts, uh, are relatively uh, lower. Uh, uh, in my personal view, uh, 2.5 for Pantawid Pasada and 500 million for farmers and fishermen, and probably the other sectors were not uh, included. Uh, would be uh, a thing that uh, should be revisited. As I mentioned, we're just talking about excise tax of 5, 6, 10 pesos being mm -hmm. collected to this uh, entire consumed uh, petroleum products per liter, and it amounted to around 105. How much more that the increase now, as I've sampled, the increase now in gasoline price from January to, to date is more than 30 pesos. That's way, way high, even to the extent of so, uh, econ uh, fin uh, monetary terms, it's the damage or the burden being, being uh, absorbed by our lesser uh, sector group uh, is three times that amount, that, that hundred, probably 300 billion pesos. So, mm -hmm. just to put it in perspective and to give 2.5 billion pesos as a uh, as an assistance and 500 million pesos for the farmers and fishermen would be very relatively uh, low. So that's my take on that. We're into the targeted, but we need to revisit the, mm -hmm. the, the coverage and probably the amount. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Director Abad. So uh, we also would like to hear the voice of, uh, of our... Um, Okay, of Mr. Rafi Kapintin of PIP. Sir, there is a question uh, for you from our uh, one of our Facebook view viewers. But be before I read that, um, well, Director Rino has mentioned, has updated us on the targeted uh, relief program. And that's very good, no? Uh, although he said that uh, there is a need to increase the allocation. So, merong nilaan ang, nilaan ang, ang government para sa ating mga transport sector at saka sa ating farmers and fisher folk. So, um, from the private sector naman, sir, meron bang assistance ang, ang binibigay ng private, sec ang private sector para matulungan naman yung ating mga uh, transport workers at yung iba pang uh, 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 apektado nitong uh, rising oil prices? Okay, uh, Sheila, thanks for the question. I, I think maraming suporta ang mga oil companies not only from PIP, it's the public sector, uh, the transport sector lalo. Kasi meron sila mga discounts na binibigay sa, sa mga jeep. Uh, alam ko, meron din silang discount na binibigay for the mga TNVS, tsaka yung mga grab, lalamove ng mga ganyan. I know there are support given to them. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Rafi. And there is a question, okay, may I read it now from Glenn Huego? Um, of DZ uh, double B, okay. For Sir Rafi, have you seen a decrease sa sales ng kanilang members dahil may observation na kaunti na ang mga bumabiyahe? If so, does it, does it have an effect sa kanila, sir? Right. <laughs> Very difficult question to answer, ma'am, because we do not discuss sales volumes in PIP. Uh, however, I would I would assume that there is a reduction in sales. Kasi maraming taong nagtitipid din. So just like me, so I, I seldom use my vehicle now dahil mataas ang presyo ng gasolina. So I'm sure it's not only me na, na nagtitipid. So there must be some reduction. However, you also need to consider that we are also at the stage that we are opening up. So it could be na nagtatabla. I, I don't know. Perhaps uh, the DOE or... or, or who monitors this will be in the best position to answer. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Sir Rafi. Okay, let's go back to uh, uh, Engineer uh, Posadas. Uh, Mr. Dean Villamayor sent a clarification that what he was uh, um, 
what he wanted to know are updates on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve or the SPR. Okay, go ahead, uh, sir. Yeah, well, we're, uh, we're really we're conducting uh, uh, a competitive selection process to get the consultant to do this because uh, this is a very delicate uh, combination of technical, financial, and legal matters that have to be taken into consideration. Thank okay. you. Thank you to uh, Chairman uh, Engineer Jess. Okay, other questions? Let me go back to our chat box. Okay, okay. why can India and China buy cheap Russian crude oil and the Philippines cannot? Okay, uh, who would like to answer this? Uh, Director Rino, would you like to uh, answer this question, sir? Uh, first of all, we have to consider uh, the uh, refining capacity in, in the Philippines. We only have one refinery, and that's owned by the by Petron. And uh, 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 most uh, per our record, uh, most of their importations are coming from uh, Middle East. In fact, uh, you know, this year they have uh, exclusively uh, imported uh, from Middle East, and uh, well not from other sources like Europe, uh, America. So uh, probably we could ask uh, Sir Rafi, uh, um, it might have uh, some kind of compatibility issue uh, uh, from yes. sour uh, oil uh, as compared to other countries which may have sweet oil. So uh, yeah. it depends, uh, most likely it depends upon the comp comp compatibility of the oil with the Refiner, uh, refinery specifications. I, I, I uh, think Rafi could confirm that. Yeah, director, you know, I think I think in response to that, I think there are several factors to consider. Number one, I think will be diplomatic, uh, because as you know, China and India have somehow sided with Russia. Okay, uh, so as such, you know, the Philippines being allies with many of those who opposed it are also joining the bandwagon of not buying from them. Second is that it is too far. So buying buying oil from Russia, you know, it may not be cheap anymore when it reaches the Philippines because of the ship, mm -hmm. because it's very mm -hmm. far. Um, that, that's, that's what I can think of. You see, number one is diplomatic, and second is uh, ang layo, masyadong malayo. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Sir Rafi. Okay, another question. Uh, this one is from Joseph Solis Alcaide, Albert C. Should we pursue more exploration and extraction like allowing 100% FDI equity participation through concessions in the upstream oil and gas sectors so that our country will become no longer reliant on imported oil and gas and become a major net exporter? Okay, who would like to answer this? Uh, Adora, you would, would you like to take a, a crack on this before I, I uh, then later on I will call the others? I think uh, that's already the uh, plan of the government. <laughs> Pursue more extraction and uh, mm. development. It's already in the Philippine Energy Plan, but uh, uh, and, and the um, uh, investors are uh, being invited every time uh, service contracting rounds are held by the Department of Energy. But uh, sometimes we encounter uh, problems that are related to uh, the diplomatic situation and uh, their, their, uh, we experienced uh, having a moratorium on uh, service contracting uh, because of West Philippine Sea-related issues. Uh, but uh, the, that is always in the plan and mm -hmm. uh, uh, diplomatic uh, solutions are also being um, pursued uh, to um, ensure that uh, investors uh, will uh, stay interested. And uh, I think uh, the Department of Energy uh, is uh, always aware 
that um, uh, you know energy security uh, is uh, uh, is a medium to long term goal and uh, uh, we need the uh, foreign investors uh, to to really pursue more extraction and uh, mm -hmm. uh, indigenous energy resource development. So that's always in the plan. But as I mentioned in the paper, um, earnestness in plan should be um, a match by action. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Navarro. Okay. Um, Director Rino, would you like to uh, uh, share your thoughts on this question? Um, uh, Mamshi, I think, uh, um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the the question whether 100% foreign ownership would apply, it's it's actually allowed. Even way back, uh, this law is uh, governed by uh, presidential decree 87. This is way, way back. Uh, at the time of uh, President Mar former President Marcos. So uh, it's allowed. Uh, that's the direct answer to that, 100% uh, foreign participation. Uh, now, uh, another uh, issues, of course, uh, why we're not getting into that point that uh, we're able to drill, for example, uh, as much as uh, our neighbors are doing uh, in a year, like Malaysia, like Indonesia. Uh, well, uh, most points to the... Uh, to the stability of contracts, for example, um, interpretations of uh, the, uh, well, recent decisions of the Supreme Court, for example, uh, there's a, the, the PD-7 was issued way ahead of the 1987 Constitution, but in the 1987 Constitution, uh, it apparently appeared in the provision of this Constitution, a requirement that the contracts will, should be signed by the President and should be notified to the Congress. Otherwise, it becomes null and void. Becomes a flashpoint in, in all these uh, contracts, which were issued way before the 1987 co constitutions, uh, Constitution. Now, the second part would be the uh, recent issue with Malampaya uh, by uh, the issuance of uh, the COA on uh, assessment of the uh, understated, uh, well, remittance of uh, of uh, income tax. So this has been a prolonged uh, discussion on the international market, even to the extent that when you go to the contracting rounds, this, uh, these questions are being clarified to us. And uh, these, uh, these items were uh, basically uh, outlined in the contracts, but yet uh, investors are uh, subjected to a latter uh, uncertainty when these uh, cases like this, scenarios like this uh, appear on the on unexpected terms, like uh, uh, a sudden assessment from, from the Commission on Audit. So uh, these were actually very familiar, PIP is actually very familiar with, this, uh, with these issues. And uh, well, uh, to the extent uh, probably we are not also uh, as, uh, as having oil as much as what we have, uh, what we have seen in, in Middle East, <laughs> but uh, this has to be, uh, 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 an issue on the exploration extent to which the country has gone through. Uh, uh, one of the discussions with uh, with the upstream undersecretary Yusek Marcos is: uh, Is it really time for the for the Philippines to buy its own uh, exploration vessel? Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, we're really in need of the exploration data. Uh, without this data, we really don't uh, uh, identify areas that are really uh, having this potential source, uh, potential uh, sources of uh, oil and gas. So if we keep on uh, relying on the private sector in getting into this uh, co committed, well, I, I quote, committed uh, ex uh, exploration data, then we lose, uh, be, we, every day we lose the time uh, by which we should, we could have developed these areas as compared to uh, other countries who finance their own exploration so that they could get the data and now show it to the investor. And then the investor immediately would be interested because mm -hmm. we already have the data rather than, you know, get invite the, the investor of something that you didn't even know uh, uh, about this particular area or that uh, particular area. So uh, that's the, the, I think the, the, shortcomings at this point in time, but uh, that's part of the discussion and I hope uh, uh, in the coming uh, 
years we will be able to go through with this uh with this exploration data uh, availability mm -hmm. of this exploration data thank you very much director abad okay we uh let me go to let let me jump to um a comment from one of our webex participants uh clearly um there's a consensus that uh among our speakers that uh, targeted relief programs targeted assistance is uh, is really important no it's it's, it's really uh, uh, beneficial um but KD Tan said that before we think about increasing the amount for the targeted fuel subsidies, which was uh, what uh, Director Reno mentioned a while ago, um, KD Tan said that we should fine tune, fine -tune the mechanisms for distribution. There are reports of drivers not receiving the subsidies or that the subsidies are being used for some other purpose. Okay, so Director Reno, would you like to comment on this, sir? Um, uh, we would have to argue with that point. Uh, uh, I, we are not sure where the the reports are coming from, uh, stating this uh, this uh, this situations, you know, in in a most depressing way. But uh, of course, uh, it's very clear that uh, LTFRB has been uh, implementing this uh, Pantawid Pasada program since uh -huh. 2018, and uh, the uh, uh, regulatory frameworks uh, are there from MOA with the banks, land bank, MOA with the Department of Energy, uh, engagement with the uh, operators of the public transport. And uh, I would try to defend LTFRB. Uh, in behalf of LTFRB, uh, we, we've seen that uh, part of the problem is that uh, even these operators are not claiming the cards, the debit cards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, another problem would be uh, Probably in the on the side of the uh, of the uh, farmers and fishermen, uh, most of these uh, uh, recipients have to be edu educated uh, on these are well. We really do not uh, want to um, uh, paint a picture about farmers and fishermen, uh, but uh, these are things that uh, come into picture when they're not really familiar with this uh, technology-based way of getting the money. So. Uh, one thing that uh, should be improved probably is uh, uh, a more engagement to the beneficiary. But mm -hmm. what Mamshi, the structure is there. Uh, land bank is very much capable of distributing a card, depositing the money, and uh, you know these uh, funds are reliable in terms of the debit card being used in the gasoline stations. Gasoline stations are very competent in receiving these debit cards. So uh, I'm not sure of, of which part of the value chain are we having this problem. Probably we could invite LTFRB uh, later or, or in, in next session. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for that suggestion. Do we have a registry or a database of uh, transport workers to ensure that uh, they are, this uh, targeted uh, assistance is, uh, is reaching them? Director uh, Lino? Well, well, of course, uh, uh, LTFRB would have the list and the Department of Agriculture will have the list of this uh, recipient. Uh, mm -hmm. Very clear in the train law, it's uh, before it's the, the operator. Probably one of the reasons that uh, many of these reports uh, are coming in that uh, the driver themselves are not are not getting the 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 card uh, because the the train law itself provided that it should be the operator. It has been fixed, ma'am. The law, the Bayanihan law, the two Bayanihan laws uh, already fixed this problem. So we should not be encountering these problems. The setup is there. The regulatory framework uh, is there. Uh, I think the bank is more than capable, land bank is more than capable to provide these cards. Uh, it's not difficult to deposit the money in these cards. So uh, the gasoline stations are very much competent to receive these cards. So mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm not really sure where is the the problem now in, in the whole value chain. So we, we just have to probably I would refer the the nitty gritty of the uh, of the remaining issues with LTFRB and uh, and Department of Agriculture. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, uh, we are down to our last two questions. Uh, we have an, an 
Okay, Gwen says, anonymous question. Uh, probably from one of our students, because we have a lot of students in the audience. Uh, basic economic question, how should we define competitive market? Is the current market uh, probably for oil? No, he's referring, he or she's referring to oil. Is the current market a competitive one? Uh, Adora, would you like to, an to answer this? Yeah. Well, as uh, uh, we've illustrated no, through examples, no, uh, there are now 400 firms in the downstream oil industry. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but and if we are, we'll compare that before deregulation. No, uh, it's clear that uh, we now have more competition. So, uh, by com a competitive market, uh, we mean that there is freedom of entry and exit by firms. There are no barriers to entry, and there is no undue exercise of market power uh, through mm -hmm. uh, quality, ab abuse of market power uh, in uh, uh, controlling quality or controlling price, no, in um, exhibiting uh, cartel-like behavior. So, mm -hmm. in, in, because uh, uh, three independent reviews have already established that uh, uh, the downstream oil industry is uh, not exhibiting a cartel-like behavior and in fact uh, prices are reasonable because uh, return on equity uh, declined after the regulation, then uh, we can say that uh, we now have a more competitive uh, downstream oil industry uh, as compared to um, the uh, years before the deregulation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Navarro. Okay, and for our last question, we have um, we have one from Ms. Jasmine Romero. So, if OPSF is not a viable solution, what is? Do you have any proposals for the government to adapt? Well, uh, yes, please, Adora, go ahead. Yeah, because that's that's uh, that's an important question. So that's what we're trying to. Uh, explain to the public, the policymakers, that um, it's not price stabilization that uh, uh, we should be uh, targeting. It's not uh, uh, lower prices that is the objective, but uh, fair prices. So, oh, is that the correct question uh, to ask? No, na what is the uh, viable option for stabilizing prices if the OPSF is not viable? Uh, what uh, the PIDS uh, through this uh, this policy research is trying to say is let's stop targeting price stabilization. Let's stop trying to stabilize prices because it's really difficult and costly for a small importing uh, country uh, like the Philippines. And uh, rather than that, uh, let's revisit the objectives, the, the, what are the actual promises of the downstream oil industry, the regulation, competitive market so that we can serve uh, more areas and uh, serve them with a good quality and fair prices. So, no, not, so the fair pricing, not not uh, uh, exactly uh, lower prices. So what should the government adopt? So her question is, do you have any proposals for the government to, to adopt? Um, the major uh, proposal of the paper is to um, strengthen policy to pursue reform durability to lack in reforms, no, so that uh, there will be less temptation to uh, backslide on reforms. There will be less temptation to uh, do policy reversals, and we can do that by um, uh, looking at the uh, uh, proposed uh, legislative amendments to the downstream oil industry uh, deregulation, and uh, th that includes. Um, legislating the minimum inventory requirement. So the, we, we've heard that uh, the uh, private sector has reservations about this, but that's about design. No? They're, not, they're not exactly opposing the minimum inventory requirement. In fact, they're, they're now uh, maintaining 30 days uh, uh, based on the, the department's circular of the DOE. So what, what the paper is saying is uh, legislate it. And now that uh, the Congress proposal is longer than uh, what the current practice is, then discuss, discuss uh, what is uh, reasonable. So other uh, possible amendments are 
uh, price unbundling, but again, <laughs> the private uh, uh, players are uh, opposing this. But uh, it depends on the design. So their argument is that uh, there are non-disclosure agreements that uh, they will be forced to to violate uh, should they be compelled to um, uh, unbundle their prices. Then uh, discuss uh, with, uh, but they, they weren't given. Uh, I learned <laughs> during this this uh, uh, event that, that they weren't given an. an um, opportunity to uh, present their case before Congress, the, but uh, th this they, they may be given another chance no, uh, in the um, uh, next discussions of uh, uh, the proposals. No? So perhaps uh, uh, they should discuss this uh, with uh, our policymakers. Uh, uh, they may be violating non-disclosure agreements. Then uh, what is the proposed design? Uh, to fix that. So th that should be the, the uh, question that uh, should be asked. So that that basically is the major proposal, no? Strengthen uh, the deregulation law by lacking the, the reforms. reforms and implementing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Navarro. Okay, we have one final question um, for Director Abad, and uh, for, uh, this one is from Joy Mariano. Do you think PD87 needs to be amended in order to attract or entice investors to explore, considering that exploration is capital intensive and that the law stipulates that all the risk and exploration shall be borne by the investor, specifically if no commercial quantity is discovered or produced? Uh, well, uh, the most contentious uh, provisions in the PD87 would be the, the sharing of the uh, national wealth. With, uh, designed at, at around 60 40 uh, sharing and I think uh, uh, another item would be to clarify the the income uh, basis uh, income tax base uh, because uh, th that has been the source of the uh, issue with uh, of, with the malampaya consortium uh, as uh, as assessed by COA uh, another another item would be to uh, probably to uh, make it easier for uh, for the approval of the contracts. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court, uh, well, it's in the Constitution. Uh, it, it will be very difficult, uh, but uh, I think uh, this has to be uh, 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 moved in a way that uh, it should not be delayed. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, you, we know for a fact that uh, if the contract will be uh, approved by the president, then uh, you would have to really pursue the uh, the contract up to the up to the president's office uh, for us to be able to to get this contract signed on time. Um, um, we also uh, would like to consider in that law uh, provisions by which uh, uh, a focus would be now uh, the government getting uh, uh, into a ser into serious participations in preparing, not really developing because it's a different. Uh, stage preparing in terms of getting really a uh, uh, budget uh, for the exploration not necessarily for the for the development and production we can give it to the private sector or we can do it by via uh, a partnership uh, or consortium uh, sharing uh, scheme uh, in terms of development of production but on the exploration on the getting into the data I think it, we will be better off uh, going into these contracting rounds if we have the data, because uh, that will that will be the only tool by which you can really interest investors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Director uh, Rino. Okay, so at this point we are closing our open forum, and to cap our discussion, may I ask each speaker for uh, his or her uh, brief uh, final remarks. May, can we start uh, from uh, Mr. Uh, Rafi Kapintin of uh, PIP? Sir, go ahead. Would you Would you have anything to say to our nothing uh, viewers? For, <laughs> nothing further to say, but just to give mention that the research of Dr. Navarro was very exhaustive. I've been in the industry a long time. I never knew that some of them happened. So thank you very much. 
And thank you very much to Sir. It was uh, an honor and our pleasure to have you at this event. Okay, um, let's uh, go to um, Engineer Chairman Jesus Posadas, Chess Posadas of the PNOC, Sir. Would you like, uh, would you have any final remarks to our audience? Yes, oh, I wanted to give a sweeping uh, uh, remark. And this has to do with, uh, and this is a general perce 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 perception that we that we have that uh, the, our the regulation, privatization, both in the from the, you start with energy resource development, downstream oil, and even in the power industry. Uh, there, there was so much uh, swing into the privatization. Uh, uh, it was it swung towards almost 100 percent of the privatization of regulation. Well, the government participation has been marginalized or minimized, such that government can uh, has very little intervention. In other words, like for example, what uh, uh, the director uh, Rina was talking about. Can you imagine government having even difficulty in, in, in providing data for exploration, things like seismic data that, uh, that will ease private sector coming in? Also, if you apply that in the, oil, the uh, downstream oil industry, where, uh, for example, as, as, this, as was uh, shown here, this issue of over and above the London inventory, private sector will not be willing and interested to go into that. So, government should be, uh, well, there should be legislation that should allow government participation. In doing so, even the unburden becomes unnecessary because government, by participating, by importing itself, for, for example, the strategic petroleum reserve, we have to do that. What would it be? And therefore, can can uh, assess whether, in fact, the competitiveness in the market. Our industry government is not allowed to go to generation. If we look at it, there's really a need for reserves to be uh, to be present so the government can come in when there is uh, uh, spikes in uh, in prices and there are outages so well my general uh, remark would be for legislation to recognize that government has a role in this privatization whether it's energy resource development downstream oil and even in the electric power industry. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Engineer um, uh, Jess Posadas of the PNOC. We're uh, very glad to uh, have you at this event. Okay, and uh, Director Rino Abad, sir, may we have your final remarks? Uh, again, I would have to uh, congratulate uh, that this uh, type of activity is uh, very much needed uh, to for us to be able to share uh, directly to the general public, uh, for us also to be able to uh, get into the uh, studies like this uh, uh, accomplished by Mam Navarro. Uh, we need this. Uh, we tend to have studies done by other countries for us, but at least uh, this time uh, it's a uh, it's uh, a Filipino uh, uh, setting type of uh, study and uh, we appreciate this. I have already downloaded the study and uh, there's nothing else that uh, we could say, but uh, thank you very much for the for this activity and thank you very much to our speak, uh, to our mm -hmm. presenter, presenter. Thank you, Mamshi. Thank you very much, Director uh, Reno. You need not look far. <laughs> the research is at PIDS. <laughs> okay, uh, and now let us hear from our speaker um, and, and author of the paper, uh, Dr. Adora Navarro. Thank you, Dr. Sayar. Um, I think uh, we're now seeing um, uh, a lot of discussions or hearing a lot of discussions about 
uh, policy reversals. So th that's the fear right now, no? not only for uh, the downstream oil industry sector, but also uh, uh, that's the fear in other sectors. And uh, as uh, a sort of uh, antidote to that, uh, there are discussions on policy continuity. But I think uh, uh, more than policy continuity, uh, reform durability should be pursued. So as uh, I have already mentioned, uh, we should uh, improve what we have right now, like the targeted relief uh, uh, programs, uh, improve the, the timing, coordination, and even the generousness of the amounts, and uh, improve the downstream oil industry deregulation law, uh, lock in the reforms uh, introduced by it by uh, examining the proposed uh, amendments to the downstream uh, oil industry deregulation law. So that's it. Reform durability should be pursued. And uh, thank you everyone for uh, participating in this uh, PIDS webinar. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. What a lively, engaging, and um, uh, insightful enlightening uh, discussion we just had. So friends, please join me in thanking uh, the speakers, Dr. Adora Navarro of PIDS, Attorney uh, Director Reno Abad of the Department of Energy Engineer, um, Jesus uh, Jess Posadas of the Philippine National Oil Company, and Mr. Rafik Pinpin of the Philippine uh, Institute of Petroleum for sharing with us their wisdom and valuable insights. Let us give all of them a big virtual clap, okay? So before we finally close, I would like to announce the winners of our poll. Okay, let me check. Uh-huh. Our winners from Webex, Domingo Ramos Jr. and Catherine Salazar. And from Facebook, uh, Mr. Ding William Mayor and uh, Mr. King Mira. Okay, so... Um, and in addition, we are also giving a prize to our top sharer on Facebook, Ms. Marilyn Gumisad Pogoso. Um, she has been uh, consistently uh, sharing our posts, sharing our videos. So thank you very much, Marilyn, for all your support. So we will contact uh, all of you, our winners, including Marilyn. You will be contacted by our webinar team for the delivery of your prize. And finally, we have some reminders, okay? So you can access all the presentations from today's uh, webinar from the PIDS website and flash on the screen is the link to uh, the full study and you can also download the uh, presentation of the PPT, the PowerPoint of Dr. Navarro from the events um, section of the PIDS website. Please also answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. We will also email you the link after the event. Your comments are important to us to improve our webinars. And please regularly visit our website and social media pages. We have a Facebook account, a Twitter account, and we also have a YouTube channel where you can uh, view our uh, uh, past uh, webinars and seminars even before the pandemic. And I would like to inform you that PIDS has a new website which comes with more user-friendly features such as easier navigation and advanced search facility, citation monitoring, and seamless interface with social media platforms. Just go to uh, uh, pids.gov.ph and the website, our website is accessible on all devices, desktop, laptop, and mobile. And flash on the screen are our remaining, our, the rest of our webinars this month. Next week, we have another very important topic on uh, modernizing the Philippines agriculture and fishery sector issues and challenges. Um, our presenter is a uh, senior research fellow, Dr. Uh, Ruelano Briones, and on June 23, we'll have a webinar on the assessment of the readiness of our Philippine hospitals to provide high-quality health care presenters. Our senior research fellow, Aval Ulep, and um, research analyst, uh, Lyle Casas. Okay, so, and finally, we would like to thank um, 
We would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academia, civil society, academic civil society, business and international development community uh, who joined us today. Maraming salamat po. So this concludes our virtual event for this week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and see you next week.